Hello everyone. Today let's take a look at parogenetic sequence and zoning of an ore deposit. Parogenesis or parogenetic sequencing is kind of an investig investigating tool used to trace the genetic history of the ore deposit. In a way it is very cool to perform the parogenetic sequencing of an ore deposit and in this lecture let's learn how to do it. Technically, parogenetic sequence is the order of formation of the minerals. Normally, it gives the time succession that is oldest to youngest of the events which gave rise to and affected the deposit. Now, what I mean here is parogenetic sequencing is capable of describing under what conditions each mineral phase in a deposit was formed or was re-equilibrated. Added to this, the sequencing also indicates the time at which the gang minerals started to be deposited and the duration of their deposition. In this video lecture, I will be discussing some of the important aspects of parogenesis pertaining to the time succession only. For more information on the applications of parogenesis in investigating the conditions of formation of ore and gang minerals, viewers are advised to refer specific research articles related to respective mineral or ore deposits. I must also warn you that not all ore deposits are capable of being parogenetically interpreted especially when the deposits are subjected to prograde or retrograde metamorphism, resulting in destruction of original depositional features. Now, the very important question we get during a parogenetic sequencing is, how are you going to do it? Well, sequencing begins with examination of the in-situ ore and polished ore samples. The aim of this examination is to identify the mineral phases present and recognize the textures exhibited in the samples or by the outcrop or in the mine walls. These features when integrated with geological and mineralogical data sets will become the most powerful tool to diagnose the time related events of an ore deposit. We can also bank upon supplementary evidences such as trace element variations, stable and radiogenic isotope evidences fluid inclusion analysis, etc. to back up your investigation report. At this point, I must warn you though, there are no common standard procedures to perform the sequencing. Each ore deposit is unique and the exploration geologist must ensure that he applies the relevant sequencing procedure for a particular ore deposit that he is exploring. Some points to remember before you begin. Ensuring a representative suite of samples are collected, which in itself is the most difficult task. Because a limited number of samples that represent the whole deposit has to be carefully collected. This is the most crucial part of the sequencing procedure. Since the samples collected will represent the ore body and all the various rock types and wall rock lithologies associated with the deposit. Missing a litho unit means missing an event that could have had significant impact on mineralization. In some circumstances, oriented samples in larger than normal polished blocks need to be studied. This part is essential because it throws light upon the interrelationship between the ore minerals, the gang minerals and the host lithologies. Sometimes they also reveal the internal structure of certain ore minerals, for example, spalarite, tetrahedrite right, etc. We'll now have a look at the keys of sequencing. Now before we begin, please do remember that these keys are generalized and must always be used in association with the regional and local geological history of the locality. Otherwise, it becomes a very messy situation. There are around 10 keys of sequencing, namely crystal shape, pseudomorphs, mutual grain boundary relations, coliform banding, growth zoning, cross-cutting relationships, twinning, exolution, replacement, and fluorescence. We'll begin with crystal shape. Crystals that exhibit euhedral or idiomorphic shape are generally considered to indicate an unobstructed medium or an open space. Minerals which commonly crystallize in idiomorphic form are fluorite, galena, spalarite, quartz, cassiterite, and covilite, and their form is often related to their specific depositional environment or position in a general parogenetic sequence, meaning the euhedral phases when present 
indicates the growth direction. When associated with stoss side growth, which you have been, which you have seen in previous video, substantiates the growth model. Shapes of individual faces also helps sometimes, like for example, convex face crystals are often formed earlier than the concave face crystals. When it comes to pseudomorphs, pseudomorph means false form or relic form taken over by a completely different mineral face. A mineral may have formed with euhedral or subhedral crystal outlines at an early stage in the paragenetic sequence but may subsequently be corroded, replaced or pseudomorphed by other mineral faces and therefore becomes difficult to position in the sequence of events. In such circumstances, relic structures, if at all can be inferred, becomes a significant evidence to establish the order of crystallization of minerals. When it comes to mutual grain boundaries between two or more mineral faces, it often indicate an equal degree of penetration into one another. In such cases, the interrelationships are quite a, quite a bit difficult to confirm, especially if there are no replacement textures or characteristically first formed crystals present. Normally, it is not possible to deduce a sequence for these minerals and it might have so happened that these minerals were deposited simultaneously. At most, care must be taken while dealing with mutual grain boundary relations. Coliform concentric banding or concentric botryoidal overgrowth structures grow outwards from a nucleus. Each growth period is indicated by an overgrowth band which may be due to a change in size, shape, orientation or color at different stages of deposition or due to the deposition of another mineral. The banding is more frequently encountered in open space filling ores and as such is common in iron and manganese oxides, uranium minerals, arsenides as well as pyrite and sphalerite. Growth zones are commonly seen in individual crystals which exhibits beautiful color bands. These bands are color zones indicating the change in the environment during formation. The growth zones in minerals not are only seen in hydrothermally deposited vein minerals but also in mag magmatically precipitated minerals such as chromites and magnetites. Cross-cutting is one of the most important aspects in erecting a paragenetic sequence and is one of the easiest to observe. For instance, if one feature cuts another, then it must be younger than that which cuts. The features may be a vein, veinlet, fold or a sedimentary structure, all of which occur in syngenetic ores. Growth twins may develop in some grains and not in others and are capable of differentiating mineral generations. For example, inversion twinning is more difficult to recognize but if seen indicates a sequence of falling temperature and at least partial re-equilibration. Similarly, deformation twinning may occur at any stage and can indicate that varying deformational processes were active during the crystallization history of the deposit. It may indicate an early deformation if present in one or more primary mineral phases or if located in minerals of all stages, it shows that deformation postdates mineral deposition. X solution intergrowths provide the best evidence that simultaneous deposition has taken place. On segregation, a granular or allotriomorphic texture, also called as mutual boundary texture, occurs. In that case, the two mineral will have smooth curved contacts without projections into each other. In replacement, since the mineral which is being replaced must have formed before the secondary mineral which is replacing it, the barogenetic sequence is obvious. Development of replacement textures is often initiated by a surface reaction on crystal boundaries and in fractures and as such will initially form an outer skin or rim to one mineral phase. As the replacement proceeds further, complete replacement of pre-existing mineral is also possible. In an advanced form, 
the replacing mineral may possess convex boundaries while the replaced face may show concave boundaries in some cases remnants of the original face may be present showing an island texture consisting of residual fragments of the first mineral in a matrix of the later face the most difficult aspect of using replacement phenomena in erecting a paragenetic sequence is when total replacement has taken place recognition of complete replacement may be helped by the presence of a crystal habit or texture that is very characteristic of the replaced rather than the replacing mineral for example cubes of chalcopyrite kogalite or goethite replacing pyrite or banded goethite replacing marcasite fluorescence is the emission of visible light due to the exposure of a mineral to ultraviolet light which may be either long wave or short wave radiation it may assist in the erection of a paragenetic sequence for rough blocks and in situ material as well as for cut and polished samples a number of minerals which are difficult to recognize ordinarily can be distinguished under short wave uv light typical examples are cassiterite scheelite and some of the common gang minerals for example certain calcites dolomites and fluorites fluorescence may also reveal growth zones and other banded features within the mineral that are not normally visible Well, these are some of the keys you can use to erect the paragenetic sequence of a given deposit. Do remember to familiarize yourself with the general geology and mineralogy of the deposit before you start with the sequencing procedure. Well, that's it for this class. Hope you all enjoyed this video. If you liked it, do give a thumbs up below and for more similar videos, hit the subscribe button. Have a nice day.